Dear Lord, please let worship go well, and for everyone, have a great night, and for kickball to be super cool and fantastic. Amen. Amen.
Father, I thank you for today. I thank you that we all got here safely. I thank you that we got to worship you. And I just pray that however our weeks are going, that you'll just protect us and you'll keep us safe and you'll let us know that you're there. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. Well done. Could you just give them a hand clap of praise for their heart to worship and serve in the church? I'm so thankful seeing, I don't want to say kids, the young adults on stage to see how much they've grown in, I don't even know, six months a year. Does anybody else notice that? Amen. I mean, even just the confidence in prayer and confidence to play the instruments, like that's amazing. I'm blessed that I get to go to a church where we have enthusiastic young people and uh, mentors that will teach them and help them grow. Amen. I mean, what's, what's more important than helping young people grow in the Lord, right? So that's a big part of what we're going to continue to talk about. So tonight is going to be session two of our verse-by-verse -verse study of the book of Titus. I'll give a brief recap of Titus 1, but I just wanted to take a minute and welcome each person who has joined us in person. It's good to see you. I'm glad you could all be here. And I also wanted to welcome everybody who's joining us online and who's going to tune in later. Um, I know being online is a little bit newer thing for us, but I'm always amazed when talking to new people who come in and just introducing myself. I never would believe how many people say, oh yeah, no, I've been watching online, that's why I decided to come. So I know it's a lot, a lot of work and effort, but it pays off. <laughs> it's building the kingdom. So thank you for everybody in the crow's nest who does what they do. And uh, I'm excited. Let's start tonight with a word of prayer. God, we just praise you. God, you are a mighty God. God, you are a faithful God. God, tonight we just honor you as creator of the universe. God, you have created all things. You have created us. And God, you have called us to be in your image. God, you have called us to be disciples. And God, you have given us your word and your spirit so that we may grow and mature and be true disciples, that we could be leaders who are under leadership, that we could be disciples who are being disciples, that we could truly follow Jesus. And God, we know where, where Jesus was going. We know that he went to the cross. He, he was crucified, and he died, and he was buried, and he rose again anew. And God, you call us to that same thing. You've called us to crucify our flesh. You've called us to set aside all of our hopes and dreams and desires of things that we want to do, and you've called us to something even better than what we could hope and desire. You've called us to be your children who walk in the Spirit, who obey your word. And God, tonight, I pray that this this study, this exposition of Titus 2 and 3, that it would just be your words tonight and not my words. That it would be your thoughts and not my thoughts. That people would be blessed by your word and your Holy Spirit, that we would grow together. As I said last week, that not only would we mature in our own stature as growing, but that we would grow together as one church so that we could just serve and honor you, that we could walk out holy lives as examples that we could reflect the light that you shine forth. And God, we pray that you would be blessed by our time tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So as I said, this is going to be verse by verse. So if you'll open up to Titus 2, that'll be uh, where we start. First, I'll give a recap. So I wanted to give a little a context and review. So the whole point of this, again, is we're, we're actually using Chuck Missler's notes as we study through this. I've mixed in some, own, some good notes and ideas that I found, and I'm going to spread my commentary throughout it. But he's the one who really built the backbone of this, so I want to give him credit. Um, 
But the, the emphasis we're taking is going to be on integrity. And by integrity, yes, we mean character as our character develops. But we also mean integrity in the fact that we are one whole mature person in of ourselves. That we don't have these sections off of like, this is church me, this is school or work me, and this is me when I'm alone. Or this is me when I'm trying to impress people. But we're one whole person filled with the Holy Spirit. And I wanted to remind everybody, as we talked about last time, who here is called into full-time ministry? All of us. Even if you're newer in the faith, guess what? God's called you to be a minister. He's given us the ministry of reconciliation. Um, in the book of Titus, the Apostle Paul is giving his young protege, Titus, some wisdom on how to walk out ministry. Um, if you remember, Titus is kind of like Paul's fixer. If there's a problem or a mess, Paul trusts Titus that he's a person of integrity and character. He knows the word, and he can send him in and kind of fix things. So we talked a little bit about, in chapter 1, Paul kind of talks about where Titus ministered. It was on the island of Crete, and he even quotes some of like the local philosophers, and it's like, yeah, all the philosophers said Crete's just a place of the worst kind of people, low moral character, uncouth in how they talk, and they're liars. And he's like, and guess what? Everything that they said about you is true. <laughs> so that's the area Paul's uh, disciple Timothy is, or Titus is ministering. Just not in the best place. But what I think is so cool is God doesn't abandon him. God doesn't go, oh, ick. Oh, the people at Crete. Oh, no, 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 no. Forget about them. We got to find a good city. Let's send people to Rome. You know, let's just focus on Rome. It's big. They're rich. You know, that's not, that's not how... God interacts with us. If he sees people who are a mess and who don't have a good reputation, he says, guess what? With a little bit of leadership, with a little bit of the word, with some modeling and some mentorship, God can turn a mess into a message, right? And I think that gives us hope. That gives us hope for our society and our city. You might think, well, I'm just from nowhere. I'm from the middle of nowhere, and you wouldn't even know it if you drove by it, right? Like, I'm from a town, if you blink and you're driving through, you probably miss it, right? But God uses that. As a matter of fact, Jesus, he is from a place called Nazareth, right? They even said, like, can anything good come out of Nazareth? <laughs> well, the Son of God, you know. So if God can do that for his son, if he can do that for the people of Crete, guess what? He can do it for us today in the city of Fond du Lac. So, <clears throat> <clears throat> sorry. So, real quick, just an overview of chapter 1. Paul gave Titus some responsibilities. That's, that's what he's exploring in the book of Titus. First thing, he wants to put things in order. Chapter 1. Chapter 2, sound doctrine. He wants to establish sound doctrine. Guess what? You're, everything's all a mess in this church. He's like, we've got to teach sound doctrine. And 3, perform and maintain good work. So this is, okay, we get sound doctrine, good. How do we live that out? So this is the practical part for us. Uh, there's also, in chapter 1, he calls out there's four according to's. So Paul's doing everything according to the faith of God's elect, according to the, tr or the truth which is according to godliness, three, according to the commandment of God, and four, according to the common faith. So everything Paul's ministering is according to the word. And we also talked about the concept of being a fiduciary, right? Being a good steward of what God's given us to do. So that's the concept for ministry, but it's taken from finances. I asked last week, anybody ever deal with like a fiduciary or a financial investment advisor, anybody, anything like that? When, when they say they're a fiduciary, that means like, hey, I'm not just trying to sell you something like a financial product. But I'm looking out for your best interest. So I'm going to make recommendations that help you grow, your, your money grow or whatever it is, that you know, your security grow if it's like life insurance or something, and not just looking out for my, my own interests. So that's what us as ministers are called to do. So if you'll open to chapter 2, here we go. Everybody buckle up and ready to read the Word of God? Amen. All right. So chapter 2, as we talk about, second thing, Paul's talking about sound doctrine. So doctrine is the difference between life and death eternally. It says you can choose what you want to believe, but you cannot change the consequences of what that belief brings you. So chapter 2 is all about sound doctrine. 
there's a, a whole list and it says a, a religious history of the 21st century. And it gives all the different like ideas and what it says. So I'm going to read some of these. I think they're kind of funny. It says, capitalism. It's he who dies with the most toys wins. Catholicism. He who denies himself the most toys wins. If you're Anglican, it says, they were our toys first. Greek or Orthodox says, no, they were ours first. <laughs> Atheism says, there is no toy maker. Agnosticism says, it's not possible to know whether toys make a bit of difference. Polytheism says, there are many toy makers. Evolutionism, it says, the toys made themselves. Hare Krishna, it says, he who plays with the most toys wins. Christian science says, we are the toys. Communism, everyone gets the same number of toys and you go straight to hell or Siberia if we catch you selling yours. <laughs> it's okay to laugh a little bit. So Baha'i, it says, all toys are just fine with us. Amish, it says, toys with batteries are surely a sin. Taoism, it says, the doll is as important as the dump truck. <laughs> Mormonism, Every boy can have as many toys as he wants. <laughs> Voodoo, it says, let me borrow that doll for a second. <laughs> Hedonism, it says, forget the rule books, let's just play. Hinduism, he who plays with bags of plastic farm animals loses. <laughs> Seventh-day Adventism, he who plays with his toys on Saturday loses. Church of Christ, it says, he whose toys make music loses. <laughs> Calvinism. Once played, always played. Baptist, only underwater toys count. Uh, Jehovah's Witness, he who sells the most toys door to door wins. Pentecostalism, he whose toys can talk wins. Existentialism, toys are a figment of your imagination. Confucianism, once a toy is dipped in the water, it is no longer dry. It's a seeker friendly, he whose toys are the most entertaining wins. The emergent church says he whose toys most simulate the dark ages wins. Of course, we're trying to be, you know, fun and amusing, but there's just so many different ways of looking at things now. Paul's like, there's so many views, but that's why it's so important to have sound doctrine, right? There's so many different ways and opinions, especially today in our modern pluralistic society that everybody's thoughts are right, right? Um, there's even a, a funny adage that it says, there's a sign out front of the modern church and the church sign says, no old-fashioned constraints. This is the home of the 7% tithe. Only seven commandments, your choice. 15-minute sermons. It's all you ever wanted and less. <laughs> so I thought that was kind of funny, right? We're always trying to appeal to people. Paul's taking the exact opposite in this situation. He's like, we're not just trying to appeal to people. We're not just going to let anything fly. We're going to teach the truth of God. So, uh, Titus 2, verse 1, it says, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. So Paul's saying, speak sound doctrine. So what's important is in the context of this, in the Greek and Roman Empire, there was something called like household management codes. So this was basically like rules of thumb for how things were administered. And that's important because lots of churches back then actually met inside of houses. So a lot of the the people that would come into the church were not only like your friends and the people that you got together in the local community. It was also like extended family because that was you know, people you lived around with. So uh, it says, We are reminded that those who were added to the church continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in the breaking of bread and prayer. So remember that the church in Crete was started out by people who were in Jerusalem at the day of Pentecost, took it home with them, started planning the church and growing and this is them trying to establish and grow the church. It says in chapter 1, the elders who Titus was to ordain were to be able to do two things, to exhort and to refute heretics. So the way this kind of looks is there's also a lot of emphasis today. You know, we sang the last song, at the cross, at the cross. Nowadays in a lot of modern religion, they're trying to get rid of the cross. And they want to have a cross without the blood. Uh, today, most of self-centered humanity recoils at the concept of Christ dying for our sins. The cross is often viewed more as an ornament than a reminder of the high price that God paid to reconcile him, himself to us. Yet the doctrine of the cross is crucial. 
In fact, the very word crucial derives from the Latin word crux, meaning cross. So that just signifies how important it is. So most often the downfall of churches and in Christian communities is when we compromise. Most dangerous are the, the little compromises we make, just little changes to appeal to people, right? So sometimes that looks like salvation without the Lord, like, you know, being saved is good, but, you know, we want to talk about all the process and, oh, the, you know, like a cross and a bloody cross and all the, the stuff that Jesus went through and judgment. Nah, we don't want to talk about that. Let's talk about being saved as if it's a good thing that's going to happen to us, right? Or church members without conversion. We just want to get people in. We don't have to worry about if they're actually saved or if they know what they're talking about or if they're being discipled, right? That's one of those compromises. It's like, well, if we just get them in, if we can just grow in numbers, that's a good thing. It's like, that's a start, but we need everyone being disciples. Amen? So worship without the spirit, people without purity, preachers without power, ministry without urgency, or society without a conscience. So all these things are things that weaken the standing of the church, right? We, some of the things that we think, okay, if we make these changes, we'll appeal to society. Being and trying to appeal to what society wants as a Christian only weakens our position because we don't stand out. We're not different, right? No one's like, oh, good, you're just like me. People get attracted to what's different, right? It's like bugs. They want to fly towards light. <laughs> you know, they, they want, you want something different. So that's what society is looking from us. So we might feel the temptation, you know, as Christians to like, okay, I need to be as appealing and as cool as I can be, or, you know. Like I work with like younger kids, and I'm not like old, but I work with like people who are younger than me. Like one time I was, uh, I was like 29, and I'm much older than 29, and one of the people I worked with said, oh, you're 29? Oh, I could never imagine being that old. And I was like, I'm 29. <laughs> you know, but it's like different generations, right? So... Sometimes it's about standing out and being different. Like, that's when people say, like, hey, why, why don't you get all worried? And why aren't you all upset about the pandemic? And why aren't you worried about being laid off? It's like, well, you know, like, I get my check from here, but it's not this place that pays me. I work for the Lord. So guess what? If we, sh you know, shut the doors and close up shop tomorrow, God's got something lined up, I'm sure. So that's the confidence we can have. So it continues that not only do we stand out and make a difference at work, but in the church community, each person has such value. That's one thing I really wanted to like hammer home and just share about is you might be thinking, okay, I'm newer in the faith or, you know, like, oh, I'm, I'm too young. I'm too old. I'm too this. I'm too new in the faith or like, oh, I've been saved for 50 years. How could I possibly relate to someone else? And in Paul's fixing for this big mess is he tells Titus to start working with what you have. Okay, you don't have a ton of character, but there, there's good people in the community. Have them start working with each other. And Paul lays out this whole plan in Titus 2. So I, I've been reading this book called Switch. Um, it's by Chip and Dan Heath, which is about like making changes and things like that. And one thing they talked about is, like I'll give you an example. There was they're trying to fix in the country of Vietnam. They're trying to fix, like all these babies were dying and stuff. And this guy was tasked with like fix this, you know, raise the child infant mortality rate in Vietnam. So he started all these studies and everything. And essentially, he was like, yeah, there's like a hundred things we could fix. We could fix the water quality. We could fix how they do agriculture. And he's like, I, I can't fix 100 things. But what he realized, he's like, I need to start on a local level, find a village. What's working? Is there anything that's working? And what they realized is that to fix this like child, baby, like dying problem, is they found out that like there was a few things that some of the good mothers did that were small changes that had a huge impact. So they're like, we're not going to fix everything. We're not going to fix the hospital system. They realized that like the mothers with thriving kids did some small things. Like they fed their kids four meals rather than two meals. They would like mix in other little fruits, foods, and stuff into the rice to help them be successful. And as they made those small changes, like they had the local Vietnamese women who were doing well teach the other women in the village and like, okay, well then you, t you have the men talk with the men and they'll figure it out. And like, just these small changes made a huge impact, right? So they were able to raise the, the child infant mortality rate significantly that way. 
those kind of concepts, right? It's in this book, Switch. It's like, this is brilliant stuff. This is how you fix things. This is how you make big changes by getting things started. And I love it because it's like, I'm reading this and I'm like, oh, that's so fascinating. That's interesting. And it's like, Paul had this figured out 2,000 years ago. <laughs> Paul's literally saying, Titus, all right, I'm going to send you in. You can fix this problem. You know how you fix it? Start having the people who are doing the right things talk to the other people. <laughs> have the older women of Crete talk to the younger women. Have the older, more mature men talk to the young men. And that's how these big changes are made. So I love that. It's like big fancy business concepts. Executives in boardrooms are reading this book thinking, this is so amazing. This is groundbreaking stuff. And the Apostle Paul is sitting there 2,000 years ago writing a letter on you know, sheepskin or whatever. He's got these same concepts. So it says, verse 2, Titus 2, verse 2. I said all that to set this up. It says that the aged men, so this is a prescribing. Again, this is uh, the character, the attributes that the people should have. It says, be sober, be grave, and we'll go through what these words mean. Temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. So what's interesting is that in the Greek and Roman society back then, these same things that Paul's talking about actually match the expectations of what it was to be considered a venerable older gentleman in the Roman Empire. So like the same thing that would make you like a classy, sophisticated kind of person. Paul's encouraging you to, to be that same thing as well as, you know, be someone who's sober, which means vigilant and serious. The word grave, it means to be respected and dignified. So don't be an, you know, uncouth and telling them bad jokes, but be someone of character. Be temperate, which means to be prudent and self-controlled. So this is the opposite of frivolous and careless, um, carelessness and like ignorance. So the, it's translated as sober. Verse 3, it says, the aged women, likewise. So again, I'm going to say this, this, that this applies to everybody. Not saying that anybody is aged. <laughs> like, this is for the old people. I'm saying, if, like, if you're more mature in the faith, then that could be like, hey, you know, you're in your late 20s, but you've been serving God and you've got some maturity. You can turn around and help younger people. You can help the youth group. Like, that's what it means. It doesn't mean like, oh, you're, you're super old and you're 80 or something. Like, that's, that's not what I'm trying to get across here. But it says the aged women, likewise, that they be in behavior as becomes holiness. So I think that's interesting. He calls out holiness. Not false accusers which means not to be slanderers or be gossipers. It says, not given to too much wine. Teachers of good things. I thought it was funny he called out wine. Like, that's even a thing in modern culture. Like, you know, like the show Last Man Standing, the mother always has to have a glass of wine. <laughs> even then, it was like, yeah, don't be like that. <laughs> so it always amazes me how much the Bible relates to our life. So again, he said, okay, the older men and women, this is how you live your example. These are, these are characteristics that you should have, and then you can turn around and teach the younger people. Verse 4, that they may teach the young women to be sober. So, oh, I'll put a pin in that. So that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, and to love their children. Because it was customary for women in those days to train and educate the other women, like the women who had kids and kind of like were like that step along could turn around and help all the young mothers who were just starting out. And, you know, the people who are already on the grandkids could help each other out. I love, I love to see that happen in the church. Like, I get to be a part of that. Like, I have people who are younger and older, and, you know, I have people who give me wisdom and discernment and support and encouragement and bless me. And then it's funny, it's like all of a sudden there's other people who have kids, and I'm like, it's going to be okay. <laughs> you will eventually sleep. <laughs> That first month, no one sleeps, but it goes by like this because you're not sleeping, and that's okay. You know, it's great that I get to also, like, share the wisdom, and, like, you, you eventually will sleep. Not much, but just a little bit. So I love that because that's, that's how Paul is saying this is how we build community. This is how we build and grow the church. It's not just about, like, hey, Paul's not here saying have a good Sunday service, all right? You need to talk about cultural stuff like movies and plays that appeal to people, we need flashy lights and smoke machines. This will build the church. You know, Paul's not saying that. That's the first thing we would think, right? We need some church growth experts in here, and we need to know, like, we need to get rid of this and paint the walls and, you know, like, everything that 
we would think, okay, how can we do this? Paul's like, you know how you build the church? By actually building relationships with each other. I know last weekend we had like bag toss, and that was actually a blessing to me. I didn't play bag toss at all. But um, I just got to sit and talk with people. Like, I got to talk to some people more in depth, and I'm like, oh, wow, I didn't know we had that much in common. You know, like, I didn't know you were that deep of a person that we got to connect like that. So it was just, it was just wonderful. And I love that that's the focus here of our pastor, too. Like, we're not going to be flashy and have all that kind of stuff. We're going to have a church that's decent in order. But guess what? We're going to grow the church by growing with each other. So verse, um, verse 5. Oh, let me go back. So he says, hey, I want you to be sober, old men, okay, and older women. I don't want you to be, you know, too much into drinking wine. Why? Because verse 4, so that you can teach the young women to be sober. So I talked last week about alcohol. I'm not, gonna, I'm not talking about alcohol this week. But it's a common expression that the sins that our generation tolerates become the addiction of the next generation. So that's something that's always on my mind because I have, you know, twin girls. They're a little over a year. And we don't teach them anything. Like, we can't just language teach them too much. Like, we always try to, like, bottle, bottle, you know, so they learn words. But everything I do, my girls watch. And it's hilarious to see because all of a sudden they have all these cute, like, head shakes. And, you know, like, if we turn on worship music, they're sitting there. And, you know, they're <laughs> and it's like, I never taught them, like, hey, when music's on, right, raise your hands. But it's things that, like, they just watch us. And every single thing we do that's a little thing, they pick up, and that's a big thing to them. And what I realized, we never grow out of that. Like, I'm looking to... to you know, elders in our church. I look to the mature believers. I look to pastor. And there's so many things that I've picked up and grown into, not because anyone said, hey, Luke, you know what? You really need to do this. Or like, Luke, when you preach, this needs to happen. But I've learned by watching and the things I take in and go, okay, well, that, that's actually effective. Like people actually understand when this happens. And I shouldn't talk so fast all the time, even though I'm really excited. Like I've learned more from just taking in I know we always said it uh, in teaching that more is caught than taught. Like we catch more for just being around the right people. And that's exactly what, what Titus is to do here, to teach the people. Verse 5, it says, to be discreet, which means sober-minded. Again, this is the same word as temperate. To be chaste, to be keepers at home, to be good to be obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. So I think it's interesting is that he's talking about like traditional family roles, like a mother and a father raising their children, how we interact with each other. And uh, this isn't like, you know, like old school, like women belong in the kitchen. Like that's not the kind of philosophy he's talking about. He's talking about a strong, cohesive family unit. And what's interesting is, is there anything more under attack nowadays than like literally just the strong family unit, mother and father taking care of their children, being together, loving each other, honoring, respecting each other, following God in unity together. Is there anything more under attack? <laughs> I mean, literally in the culture, in certain political movements, I'm not going to get into all that, but even on TV, if you, if you ever watch TV shows, it's like the dad's a buffoon, you know, he's just like callous and terrible, no morals, no substance of anything, and it's like, I don't know, I don't know many men like that, I don't know a lot of perfect men, but men aren't like that that I know, you know, and they're just the biggest buffoons and no sense of anything, and you know, the women are drunks and they're callous in how they talk and they're rough, and it's like, that's not how we are, but that's how... The family's being represented right now. And, of course, the kids just know way better than the parents, and they're always so, like, snotty about, well, I'll show mom and dad. And It's like, why is that? The devil's out there working on that for a reason. And the same thing was happening in their culture. That's why he's saying to Titus, like, you got to establish these things. Your family unit has to be strong so that the propaganda of the world doesn't tear all this down. So it says, keepers at home. So that's a strong ministry. I'm thankful that mentors in my life said, like, your first ministry is your family. And they meant that. Same thing. Women, your ministry is your family. 
So, it says, if parents don't discipline themselves, they can never discipline their children. So this is the, the, the emphasis on character and how we relate to people. You know, they always said, like, oh, don't do what I say, do as I, or, yeah, don't do as I do, do as I say, right? That never works. That's not how relationships are established. But, again, I love that he talks about how do we grow the church? Relationships. Paul understood, so we talked about the concept of fiduciary investments. Paul understood that the greatest investment you can make is investing in people. He's not just talking about money. He's talking about time. He's talking about your talent. Like, you know, I have a, you know, teaching or whatever, you know, my talents are. My first investment should be in the people around me. It should be in my family. It should be in those people that are in my circle that I can influence. Same thing for all of us out there. Whatever your talents are, you know, you might be someone who's easy to talk to or who can listen or, you know, maybe it's writing nice cards. Like, that seems like a small thing, right? But I, I love giving and receiving cards. Like, just the gesture of, like, you took time out of your day, found this card, thought of something to say. It's like, wow, that really blesses me, right? So some of those things, like, oh, my talent is just a small thing. It's like, but God's given you for that to build your family, to build your relationships, to build the kingdom. So I love this. Isn't this kind of like a paradigm shift? Like, I know we're going through this, and it just, like, makes sense. But when Paul, like, is actually talking about apostolic ministry, building the church, building the kingdom, building your family, it kind of turns everything that we would think of upside down. So Paul stresses relationships because we all need models. So there's um, this next section kind of talks about a pattern of good works. So we talked about sound doctrine, you know, show what that looks like, display that. And then, you know, here's how we live that out. It says, verse six, young men, likewise, exhort to be sober-minded. Verse seven, in all things, showing yourself a pattern of good works. In doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, Sincerity. So Paul uses a word here in Greek, tupos, which literally means type. So when you think of it, like who here works in like machining or engineering or anything, like in a shop, like injection molding, anything like that? Okay, like, well, um, if you're building like, you know, an automated machine types of things, you need a prototype. You need a template that, hey, all the things that come in the next series of this are going to be built off this. That's exactly what Paul's talking about. Like, we should be living examples that we can be a prototype for the next generation, right? Christ was that for us. He gives mature people in the body to be that type of example to other people. So he uses the word type, and it's, it's more than just an example. It's a model. It says in doctrine, showing yourself uncorruptness, which means complete conformity to the word of God. Verse 8, it says, sound speech that cannot be contemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. I like this. It's like you could live a life of character so good that if someone stands against you, they, they're going to be ashamed of themselves because you're just that good of a person. I was like, oh, that's so cool. Like, that's, that's the type of integrity that we can have. If someone opposes you, at least they got to go, yeah, well, they're, they're a great person. Yep, they live with integrity, but, you know, if they, were, if they were trying to lay out their case, it would almost be embarrassing and that they would stand against you. He's saying, like, be that kind of a person, especially in a culture of corruptness, right? The Crete, they were liars and deceivers and all that. They had their reputation. He's like, you know what? You can stand out and be different, and that's a good thing. You're not going to blend in perfectly with the culture around you, and that's the point. I love that. So it's interesting, he says, he finishes verse 8, having no evil thing to say of you. So I thought that'd be interesting to talk about the difference. Who knows the difference between character and reputation? Do you know the difference between character and reputation? Character is what you actually are in reality. A reputation is what other people say about you and your character. So as a person of integrity, right, integrity is our focus here being a disciple, we are to be a person of integrity to the point that even our reputation, what other people say about us, is accurate and reflecting how strong character we have. So I saw some interesting points here. I think we can probably get through this. Um, 
verse 9, it says, Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again. <laughs> so that's some interesting, uh, um, some comments on this. It says, servants. What's interesting is that 90% of the names on the walls of the catacombs are those of slaves or ex-slaves. It says, you know, to be obedient to masters, to please them well in all things. So this is about going the extra mile, doing things from the heart. And this is what Paul talks about in Ephesians 6, verses 5 to 7. So Ephesians 6, verses 5 to 7, it says, Servants, be obedient to them that you are your masters, according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in singleness of heart as unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men. So it says obedience to the masters according to the flesh. This is physical and not mental. This is spiritual or of the conscious. So, so what does Paul mean here, right? He's talking about how we live our lives out as, at work how we interact with our boss. So it's interesting. I was talking to um, one of the people I work with, and I was telling them, you know, and they were talking about, um, not in a bad way, but like about, like if someone could get fired. I'm like, oh, well, these people are safe. Like, you know, I don't know if I'm of that, like, status. And I was like, are you kidding me? Like, we could all get fired. Like, I could get fired. And I even told them, I was like, the owner of our company, and I said his name, he can get fired. It's like, he owns the company. It's like, yeah, like every day a customer could fire him. It's like, guess what? I'm not doing business here. I'm firing you as the person I'm doing business with, right? So we're all, even if we're owners of our own businesses, we all have bosses that we have to submit to in certain ways. So Paul's saying, yeah, it says in singleness of heart in Ephesians. So this is, hey, if you work 60 minutes in an hour, we're supposed to give it everything we have, work in the full 60 minutes, because we're not just working for our boss, we're working for Christ. But there's some notes on this. is obviously talking about slavery because there are so many slaves. It says almost half of over 100 million people of the Roman Empire were slaves. It says the New Testament doesn't condemn slavery as such because every true believer is a bond slave, as we talked about before, duolos, of Christ. The New Testament has more to say to slaves than it does to kings. Isn't that interesting? Paul was careful not to confuse the social system with the spiritual order within the church. Uh, feudal peasants, so this is kind of some interesting points here, feudal peasants in the Middle Ages owed their landowners 25% of the fruits of their labors. <laughs> Boy, that slavery sounds terrible, right? You have to pay 25%. Today, we, all, we work till July before we can earn for ourselves because we end up paying over 60% of our income in federal, state, municipal, and other taxes. So uh, in this study, he gives a whole glossary of conduct. He talks about what it means to be faithful, to be a fiduciary, to... And he even goes into like the wrong things like fraud and embezzlement. And we won't go through that all tonight. But he gives even legal definitions of what it means to be a fiduciary and what that requires of us. Um, but we're going to go on to verse 10. It says, not purloining. So again, this is teaching people the character. But showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. So purloining, again, means stealing. This is, um, we're supposed to be faithful in executing our duties. It says, showing all good fidelity. So that's that fiduciary. Like, I'm going to be faithful to what I'm called to do at work with the people I'm called to minister to as a fiduciary. What's interesting, it says, adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. Adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. So that's living out doctrine. The word adorn in Greek is cosmeo, which means to bring order out of chaos. Right? This is exactly what Paul's doing. He wants to do in this whole church by sending Titus. But he doesn't just like, hey, I'm going to fix the whole church. He starts with one person. He starts with one individual. And I think that's what God has to say to us tonight. 
Yes, God wants to, to fix this world. Yes, God wants to fix Fond du Lac, the community. Yeah, he wants to get rid of all the drugs, get rid of all the alcoholism, get rid of all that. But you know who he starts with? He starts with me. He starts with you. Each person as an individual. I think that's powerful, right? Even when we think of Jesus' ministry, like how many people did Jesus minister to? Well, like a bunch of people, right? He gave a bunch of speeches on hills. Um, who were his main audience? Well, like 70 people, right? And he sent them out in pairs. Okay, but who did he spend most of his time with? <laughs> 12 people. It's like, okay, again, if we're, if we're planning out ministry, Jesus, this is the worst ministry plan ever. <laughs> I'm going to find 12 random people who aren't ministers, all right? They're fishers and carpenters. And some of them are unruly and fighters, all right? I'm going to find 12 of those people. Okay, cool. So you're going to spend your whole life with them, right? Nope. I'm going to be a carpenter the first 30 years and be a really good carpenter. Be faithful in doing that. It's like, okay, three and a half years you're going to spend with these people, right? You're going to, and 12 of them? Like, you should be doing a lot more to scale your ministry. And he's like, yeah, but I'm really going to focus on three of them. <laughs> Peter, James, and John, right? I'm going to find the best of the, it's the best of those 12 people, right? Nope, Peter. <laughs> The guy who can put his foot in his mouth faster than anybody. <laughs> you know, and James, James is a brawler. Like, he's this tough guy. He always wants to fight. And John was real soft and emotional. Like, he was always looking out for Jesus. Like, he was leaning on, like, Jesus, like, you know, if one of you is going to betray me. John's leaning against him. It's like, whoa. That's how Jesus does ministry. But he understood it's about depth, not just width. You know, like so many of the old school revivals on TV, they preached, you know, how many, 50,000 people. And Billy Graham did all this amazing work and preached to all these people. And that's great, right? Everyone needed to hear the gospel. But you know what people really need? To get into a good church, to get under a, someone's biblical authority, to fall under leadership and get discipled and grow. Right? That's how good ministry takes place. So you might think, like, oh, I'm just coming to church on a Wednesday night and listening to this guy talk verse by verse, and he's taking forever, right? It's like, but what you're doing right now is good growth. Like when you plant a tree or, you know, like a vine or something, you want good growth. There's nothing, you know, if you're like you plant a tree as it grows, if there's all these mangly branches and it doesn't grow right, it's like, oh, man, you got to get out your ladder and trim off all these wrong branches because it's not growing right. And if you let it be all unruly, like eventually the tree dies because it's not growing right. It doesn't grow in a sustainable way. It's not getting proper nutrients. It's not getting the light the right way. But when you grow in the right way, it's just a beautiful sight to see some of those trees. How many people love seeing the trees in the summer, right? I love knowing that the fall's coming and to see all the, the colors start changing, right? That's all that beautiful, consistent, faithful growth. And that's what God wants for us. That's what he wants for you. That's like the right thing. There's nothing that feels more wrong than just being consistent and growing where you're planted and being obedient, right? In the moment, it's so boring. Like, I should be doing more, right? We should be having more amazing things like this, you know, amazing heavenly experiences and all this stuff, right? It's like, that's what you feel like you should be doing. But God's saying that comes when you grow the right way and you're faithful and consistent and you're obedient to be where God's called you to be. Isn't that exciting? I think so. So, we're wrapping up. I only have a couple minutes left here. Um, so it says, verse 11, salvation to all men. It says, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. That's good news, <laughs> literally. It says there's grace in three, three tenses. It, it has, hap has appeared, past tense. It's teaching us, which is the present tense. That's in verse 12. And it's looking for that blessed hope, which is in verse 13. So verse 12, like we said, teaching us. That's present tense. That denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. God is not trying to reform this world. He's redeeming those who accept Christ. And redeem means to set free by paying a price. And we're all slaves and cannot set ourselves free. But he gave himself as a ransom for us. Verse 13. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing 
of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. So this puts it in the context of what we can expect and see coming. I think one thing I wanted to call out in Greek, so this is a grammar thing, but don't get lost because it's grammar. It says there's one definite article. It says the great God and our Savior. Jesus Christ is our great God and Savior. Who, verse 14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous for good works. I think that's so power. He redeems us from all iniquity. That's one thing I, I, I would love to talk more about, but I don't want to talk too late tonight. God saved us from sin. Not that we can go on singing, right? There's so many things like, well, you know, I can, like, there's grace, so I'm allowed to do this. You know, I don't want to hammer that. But again, God saved us so we don't have to. We're free from all that. I mean, that's something I'm just trying to live out right now, right? I'm saved from desserts and soda. <laughs> I know there's grace, but as I try to be more and more healthy, God didn't save me and give me grace. We're like, all right, it's fine to drink all that soda and stuff. Like, I'm trying to be like, I'm free from that. I don't need that. That's got nothing for me. <laughs> that's just my own testimony right now. So he, and he calls out Z, zealous for good works. This is a Jewish praiseworthy virtue for the, for the Jews at that time. They had zeal for the law of God. Verse 15, these things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. So when we live these holy lives and talk about holy living and virtuous integrity, we should have authority in that. It says, let no man despise you. Like I said, you're going to stand out and be different. Don't let anybody shame you for that. I know there have been times at certain functions, like I don't drink at all. We're Church of God, so that's, that's a big core virtue for us. And I've been to put, like, places where people drink, and it's so funny. <laughs> like, it's like, that's okay that you don't drink. And I'm like, I know. <laughs> like, no, no, really, that's totally fine. We, we're okay with that. And it's like, I know. <laughs> I don't have a problem with it. <laughs> like, I'm not saying you can't. You can do whatever you want. You're, you're an adult. But, you know, I don't do that. It's just so funny to see, like, that's almost like a weird thing that I don't drink. Like, I'm imbalanced, and it's going to be okay. <laughs> it's like, nope, I'm totally fine. So, but that's the, that's the attitude and position we can have that. No man can despise us. So, this, this has to do with ambassadorship and the examples that we live. So, my closing thought is, what are the things that God is calling you to live out? Right? So, this is great learning stuff. Yes, integrity character, being examples, living out sound doctrine. But I want you to think, like literally every person, I mean this like, please think this. This isn't just like a good closing thought. It's something that sounds good. And for you at home too, like literally think, who is a person that influences and mentors me? Right? That lives out the gospel, that you know, has integrity and character, that can shape and influence you. They often say, you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. When I actually pondered that and looked at people I spent the most time with and realized that I'm the average of the five people I spend the most time with, I realized like I need to hang out with some different people sometimes. Right? I need to live around people who have integrity and are godly, character-driven people. And if you don't have that relationship, pray about someone who can step into that role who can mentor, and, he, and, and it's at any age, right? It's not about age, it's about maturity and wisdom and being connected to the body of Christ and the Holy Spirit and so other people who can speak into your life and correct you and hold you accountable and also encourage you and speak life into you too. And then the second thing, I want you to think, who can you mentor? Even if you're really young, even if you're like, hey, I'm just a teenager myself, there might be like someone in your friend group who needs the encouragement, who needs someone of character to say like, yeah, no, I don't think you should do that. You know, when they have problems, right? Problems at work or school, and they're like, hey, someone's really pressuring me to do this. And if you can say like, yeah, if you don't feel comfortable, don't. Like what freedom would that be? How many people as teens did things that's like, oh, I wish I had someone to talk to who I could say like, oh, I wish I didn't do that. Or I could say like, hey, I don't feel right doing this. Does that make sense, right? And they'd be like, yeah, don't do that. <laughs> right? I, we, we all wish we had that. Well, it's nice as you realize you can be that in someone's life right now. So, like I said, think about who, who can mentor you and who can you mentor. And then take action. Like, I would love next week to check in and see, like, who, who's done that? 
who's found and made a connection. And again, it doesn't have to be like great grand gestures, like I need John Maxwell to mentor me. It's just someone you know. And even if you could just reach out and speak life into someone else in your life, take action on that this week. All right, so I'm going to close this in prayer. God, we thank you tonight for your word. God, we thank you that us being here as the church, God, that as we connect through relationships, as we connect through your word tonight, God, we thank you. God, it's not always flashy. It's not always impressive. Maybe it's not as headline grabbing as we had hoped, but God, we thank you that this is what it's like to be a disciple. God, we thank you that we get to sit under the teaching of your word, that we get to hear the example of Paul teaching to Titus. And God, I pray most of all that we would just grow as disciples. And not just so we can say, oh, wow, look at me, but so that we can actually be light and salt in this dark world. God, I pray that we would grow as disciples so that we can build the kingdom. I mean, truthfully build the kingdom, that people who are disconnected and outside of your will, who are not going to heaven, that we could just be light in their life and connect with them so that they would just be drawn closer to you. God, I pray that you would bring godly people into our life, that we could know each other more deeply in this, in this setting and as a church as a whole, that we could be mentored and discipled, that we could grow together with our mentor. And God, most of all, I pray you'd put it on people's heart that every person in this room right now, every person in this building, every person watching and watch later, that they could just have someone that you would put on their heart that say, hey, you can minister to them this week. You can give a little bit of leadership and mentorship that in this instance, you can speak life. You can speak encouragement. God, you can even, I don't want to say rebuke, but maybe that's too strong, but it, that you can just give wisdom, that we all could give wisdom to somebody so that we have this friend or whoever that they don't make a critical mistake. God, I pray that we could just be a good confirming word for other people in their lives. God, I pray that you would just equip us as we study this so that our gifts and each person's callings would be sanctified by your word and that they could walk confidently in the gifts and the callings that you have given them. Um, and that's just my prayer tonight, God. God, I'm so thankful for this opportunity to teach through this. God, if anything, I'm an example that you don't have to be perfect or you don't have to be the most perfect at everything and everything perfect. But if, if you've been down the road and if you've gone down a step, you can reach back and help someone take the next step with you. God, I pray that that would be each of us this week, that if we take a step forward, we pull someone else with us. That we all just take steps closer to you so that in our lives, you would be worshiped and glorified. God, you are an awesome God, and we praise you. We thank you for all this. And um, we just pray that most of all, you would be blessed by this time. And God, I pray next week that as we get together, that there would be praise reports, that people connected with a mentor, and that they mentored someone else. Um, and we thank you for that. Through your son Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, God bless you. Have a good night, everybody.